Well, warm welcome to this talk. It's Monday the 3rd of January. Now, we've been wondering for a while, having noticed that the clinical features and the clinical course of Omicron is less severe than previous variants, whether that was due to the immunity or the fact that it was intrinsically less pathogenic. Well, it turns out to be both. And we're going to be giving evidence in this talk that it is less pathogenic, infecting mostly the upper airways, the, the bronchial passage in the trachea and the mouth and the back of the throat, the pharynx, rather than down in the lung tissue. But before we do that, there's a couple of really important things I want to just sort of reiterate, really. And the first one is the symptoms. Now, these are just updated from the COVID symptom tracker data. Um, Omicron symptoms. How do we recognise it? Well, fever is less common, cough is less common, and anosmia, the loss of taste and smell, is now really quite uncommon. So um, we can't rely on these anymore at all. These are the most common features now. 65% of people with Omicron infection get a headache. 65 get fatigue. Now, the level of fatigue, the level of tiredness can vary quite a bit. It can be completely debilitating to fairly mild. So very variable fatigue, but fatigue nonetheless, 65% report that. 65% of people infected with Omicron report a runny nose. 57% report a sore throat and 55% report sneezing. All features that we are rather familiar with from having colds as long as we can uh, remember. So pretty important list of clinical features there to remember. The, 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 the presentation has changed completely since, say, this time last year. Now, just before we go on to look at the, the science I want to look at today, let's look at some um, COVID symptom tracker data, which is always pretty useful to look at. Now, this is new symptomatic cases up to the 27th of December. Now, the blue line is everyone. And clearly we can see that the dots are much further apart. So the line is going up steeply. That's everyone. But the red line is in those that are already uh, doubly vaccinated. So we can see that there's a dramatic increase in cases in the doubly vaccinated. Now, we do see that the dots are a bit closer together there. So the rate of increase or the rate of acceleration has uh, decreased as the numbers carry on increasing, but less rapidly. The phase of exponential growth does seem to have passed. But we still see that doubly vaccinated people getting lots of infections even compared to the people that are uh, fully, uh, even to the people that aren't, they aren't, they aren't vaccinated. So doubly vaccinated, unvaccinated, both getting symptomatic disease alike. Now, this is the incidence by age group. Now, this really is quite significant. I want to show you a couple of things here. Now, first of all, we see that the fastest rate of increase has been into the 18 to 35 year olds, which is this line here. Now, they have increased dramatically. And of course, these are the group of people that are least likely to be hospitalised. So are we getting a false impression of the lowered risk of Omicron? Well, I don't think we are, actually. But there is another proviso here. And now this red line here is the 55 to 75 year old age group. And here we see a dramatic increase in cases in that 55 to 75 year old age group. And of course, some of these, a very small minority, but some of them um, are going to feed through into more severe illness and potentially hospitalizations. And there will be some deaths, although we believe dramatically less. So that does show the sort of shift in the demographic of those that have been infected. We see that the younger age group here have been infected earlier than this older age group. And we're going to have to watch that closely to see how that pans out. Now, this is the areas of the UK. And of course, we see London has increased dramatically. But actually, just off the edge of this graph <laughs> over the last few days, which we don't show in this data because this is only up to the 27th of December. But this rate of increase, so as it's still increasing, but it's not increasing as fast. The, it's not exponential. It's just a linear increase in cases now looking like it might be plattering off soon. And the other thing is the population of London is less vaccinated than other parts of the country. And uh, it may be that this is a factor. Also, there's a high incidence of people from African and Afro-Caribbean backgrounds in London. And as we've said many times, they're going to produce vitamin D more slowly than pale skinned residents. So that could also be a 
factor there. So is the rest of the country going to go the same way as London? Well, yes, we can see it's increasing. Is it going to be as dramatic as London? Probably not quite as dramatic as London is the, is the hope. Now, this is quite an interesting one. Comparison of new onset uh, cold-like illness and the new onset of COVID with respiratory symptoms. Now, this is this is a COVID with respiratory symptoms. So this is people diagnosed with COVID who are suffering from these uh, these um, these features here. We just looked at these common cold features, and we see that there's almost of that many of them. People with COVID colds, what we could call COVID colds, as actual colds caused by all the other uh, upper respiratory viruses put together. Um, interesting. And actually now, um, th these two lines have now crossed because, again, this is only up to the 27th of December. So there we saw that just under half of uh, colds were COVID colds and uh, just over half of colds were non-COVID colds. Well, now we know with the latest data that 75% of colds are now COVID colds. In other words, this blue line will be now be much higher and it would be higher than this orange line. So at the moment, most times when people think they've got a cold in the UK, in the majority of cases, they're actually suffering from um, SARS coronavirus 2 infection, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Now, what I want to talk about next, just before we go on to the science, is what we might call, and it does, it does link in, it's not, it's not completely distracted, disjointed, um, what we might call the Australia experiment. Record infections, plans to reopen the economy. Now, is this as ridiculous as it sounds? Well, let's just look briefly at some data from the UK. Now, here we see the cases uh, in England. Now, OK, it's over the bank holiday and the cases might be not being fully reported, but that's the English data there over the past month. Are cases starting to go down a bit? Probably not, but they're not going up as quickly as they were. But then we can compare that to Scotland that has had much stricter regulations and we see, well, that theirs has actually gone up a bit more. Now, I know we can't make too much of this because it's only a small amount of data and it's over the bank holiday. But I think what we can safely say from this data is that uh, the cases in England are not massively outpacing the cases in Scotland. I think we're pretty safe in saying that. So is this informing the Australian thinking, perhaps? So um, the plan basically opened up. Scott Morrison, uh, we have to stop thinking about case numbers and think about serious illness. Yep. OK, I think we can all agree on that, really. Think about living with the virus because we're going to be for the next few years managing our own health and ensuring that we're monitoring those symptoms. Well, I'm not sure why we'd want to monitor the symptoms unless we we're going to isolate. So I'm not quite sure what Mr. Morrison means there, but um, we'll leave it uh, and, and keep our country going, which, of course, I think a lot of people would uh, would certainly agree with. So it does seem to be a fairly um, is this a fairly fundamental change in philosophy in Australia? I think it probably is. I think it probably is. Um, another another line of evidence, Queensland Chief Health Officer, Dr John Gerrard. Uh, Omicron peak at very large numbers in late January or early February. Well, I agree completely. If you live in the UK, or you live in the United States, or you live in Australia, or you live in Canada, I think that the Omicron cases are going to go up dramatically for the next three or four weeks. Peak at around about the end of January, beginning of February, probably near the end of January, I would think, and then start to decline. So I, th I think Dr. Gerard is, is probably correct in that. I think that's a fair assessment. So certainly going to pass that one. Uh, we are expecting in the next few weeks, very substantial numbers of people are going to be infected. Yes, this is completely inevitable because, as we've just seen, there's no indication that the enhanced uh, lockdown or the restrictive measures in Scotland have uh, reduced the spread of Omicron any less than the less restricted England. I'm not saying I don't want to go on from this and say we don't have to practice precautions. We do because we still need to reduce the spread if we can to level things out. But let's go on. Let's go on with this Australian thinking. I think we uh, just have to assume that all of us are going to be exposed in the next few weeks. Yeah. So I already have dozens of uh, friends and colleagues exposed and, and uh, feeling slightly unwell now or testing positive now. 
uh, all over the world actually and uh, I'm sure you have as well. Um, I've The last time I tested about a week ago I was still negative, did have a common cold but still testing negative. Now when I did this I did, I did do a, a, as near a pharyngeal swab as I could as well and a nasal one as well I think it may there's some tentative evidence emerging that the the level of the virus with omicron might be lower in the nose and higher in the pharynx so trying getting to the back of the mouth is probably important doing the nasal one as well but but anyway i i, I did both and it was negative but i've had three vaccines so i may well be completely asymptomatic or protected from infection or i may get it soon as because people are breaking through but we'll, we'll look a little more on, on the levels of infection in a minute i don't want to preempt that uh, uh, Dr. Gerard again, we can expect very large numbers of cases and in the majority of cases, the vast majority of cases, the symptoms will be mild and this is what the science we're going to look at today is indicating. And then he says so clearly the vaccine is working. Now that's what I would call a non sequitur um, <laughs> because the cases are mild, it doesn't show that the vaccine's working. It could be that it is, intrin it is intrinsically less pathogenic. Now, of course, we know it's a bit of both, but um, I'm being a bit pedantic there, but that is a non sequitur. Because the vast majority of cases of the symptoms will be mild doesn't mean that the vaccines are working. Yes, I think it's going to help, but um, that's not a logical, uh, a logical inference. And the, the last bit of data from Australia, just before we go on and look at the, uh, the science cases, which I'll probably do fairly quickly now, but there we go. Uh, Queensland Premier uh, Anastasia, um, this lady here, and <laughs> we'll call her Anastasia. Um, what we're doing is telling people to go and get vaccinated, okay, especially if they have a booster dose. We know that's going to be efficacious. We have given every Queenslander in this state the opportunity to get vaccinated, okay, I agree, detecting a bit of uh, frustration there, but understandable. I'm no urging people in those indigenous communities to ignore the social media posts and immediately go and get vaccinated, your vaccination. So it looks like in indigenous groupings in Australia, um, there has been uh, some um, information which might be uh, le less than accurate. Now, I do know, happen to know that quite a few indigenous Australians are what I know because you've told me that quite a few indigenous Australians are watching this. And, and we can say that if, if people have had the booster dose, they are less likely to get severe disease and symptomatic disease. So I am going to give evidence for that now as well. Now, just a quick run now through this evidence that I've been promising you since the start of the video. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 Omicron variant replication in human respiratory tract ex vivo. So these were bits of tissue taken out of people who'd had uh, operations. Uh, we've looked at this before. This is just a recap. Omicron infects uh, and multiplies 70 times faster than Delta in the human bronchus. That's in the upper airway. So remember the uh, trachea divides into the right and left main bronchus. That subdivides into the bronchial tree, <coughs> subdividing into smaller alveoli, eventually going into the lung tissue. So um, we don't want the lung tissue infected because if the lung tissue gets infected, we get consolidation and that's what pneumonia is. So uh, we, we don't want that. Um, we don't want infection here. And the virus has grown much more slowly here than it is here, causing upper airway infection. And, and, and also probably the virus is growing in the mouth as well, it looks like. Uh, which again is less concerning than in the lungs where we don't want it. So 70 times faster up here, uh, 10 times slower down here for the Omicron is what that data is showing. So that was, uh, I'm going to show you these briefly because I don't want to think, make you think I'm making this up. So that's that paper there. Do check that one out. Um, next paper here is this one here. Now, of course, a lot of these are preprints because this is early stuff, but they are focusing in in agreement. Uh, I'm not just picking the ones that agree. I have looked around for ones that disagree and there aren't any. They, they, they are all essentially in agreement. Uh, with, with, with the contentions that we're making here. So that's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the next paper there. That's this one. SARS-CoV-2 Omicron B11529, which of course is the Omicron, uh, leads to less severe disease. Now, th th this is a test virus used in animals, um, but it leads to less severe than Delta variant strains in a mouse model. Now, this is in mice, okay? You could argue that that's not relevant. But uh, the mice and the hamster models have been pretty good so far, especially the hamster ones, actually. 
But anyway, let, let's look at what it says. Mice infected with Delta compared to mice infected with Omicron. The Delta, the, the Omicron infected mice rather, less severe clinical changes, less weight loss, so the Omicron is less severe. Lower viral load in uh, Omicron, which is interesting. Less extensive inflammation in the lungs in Omicron, therefore less likely to get pneumonia. T cell epitopes probably conserve. Now, a bit jargon there, but the, the epitopes, the epitopes are the part of the antigen that the immune system recognizes as being foreign. So it looks like the T cells are still responding to these, protecting against more severe disease. Although these were in mice that were previously uninfected. But, but the evidence they've looked out there in retrospect does show that the T cells do seem to be working. So further good news for mice and humans. Uh, clinical consequences of infection with the Omicron variant may be less severe. Direct quote, which is what all the evidence is showing. But the higher transmissibility could still place a huge burden, burden on healthcare services because it's all happening at once. Now, these were in previously uh, unexposed mice, so this is indicating that this is intrinsically less pathogenic. So the reason we've got less severe disease in South Africa was partly because of the large amount of immunity, but also now it would appear uh, because the virus is intrinsically, the Omicron is less uh, pathogenic than the Delta and indeed the Beta that went and the Alpha before it. Right, so the Omicron SARS-CoV uh, variant of concern does, n does not readily infect Syrian hamsters. Now, that's uh, this study uh, there. Now, th this might sound like a bit of a strange one, but hamsters have reacted to uh, sars coronavirus 2 uncannily similar to humans. Very, very similar and they've been used as models uh, throughout this pandemic, and, and they've been very, very similar. So are hamsters and humans really quite related in terms of response to the virus? Now, we don't know this is going to be the case with Omicron. Of course, we don't know yet, but it's likely because it's, it's been the case with all of the previous variants, uncannily similar. All of the SARS coronavirus 2 variants of concern replicate uh, efficiently in Syrian hamsters. They've been uncannily like humans. In hamsters that had been infected with Omicron, with, with Omicron a 3 log 10 lower viral uh, load was detected in the lungs. So I guess that's three orders of magnitude. So that's a thousand times less, isn't it? A thousand times less virus detected in the lungs. If it's the case in Syrian hamsters, it could well be the same in humans. I like the sound of that. A thousand times less virus in the lungs. No infectious virus was detectable in the lungs. Wow. None. Well, essentially, well, not at detectable levels. Histopathological examination, so that's looking at the tissues in the lung, from Omicron-infected hamsters showed no signs of pneumonia. It was just affecting the upper airways. So again, uh, pretty good news. This is the next paper here, um, also about hamsters. But again, we know they're a good model for humans. All the links are there, of course. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 Omicron virus causes attenuated infection, milder infection, and disease in mice and hamsters. So they actually isolated the virus. Not quite clever, isolating the virus in cell lines. These were given to immunocompetent uh, immuno mice and hamsters. Now, these mice and hamsters have been jiggled around with, genetically speaking. They're what you call transgenic organisms. So the gene that, it co that codes for the, uh, for the ACE2 receptors, how the virus gets into the cells in humans, human gene, has been put into a mouse and a hamster. So the mice and the hamsters produce ACE2 receptors, which are identical to human ones, making them a, an interesting model for experimentation. Now, I'm not going to argue about the ethics of that. I'm uncomfortable with it. I'm uncomfortable with the animal experimentation. I'm just reporting what has been done. This has been done. Um, even though I'm uncomfortable with it, but it's been done. So these animals are now expressing human uh, human tissues, essentially, and they get attenuated lung disease. They're not as ill and they have lower viral loads. That's on human ACE2 receptors, albeit present inside uh, the respiratory passages of mice. Um, this paper here is uh, this one, I think. Is that that one? Yep, that's that one. 
Okay. Now this one, SARS coronavirus two. Um, th these are receptors. This receptor here actually modifies the virus prior to uh, adsorption onto the ACE two receptor. But but anyway, th so th th these two membrane proteins um, are both expressed in bronchial transient secretory cells. Now th these cells are transient because they later become um, they later become ciliated um, respiratory uh, endothelial cells, the ones that have the uh, cilia. So it's the cells which are later going to develop the cilia, these wafty hairs, uh, that become infected. And the thing about these wafty hairs is they're present in the nose, the, uh, the trachea, the bronchial passages, down into the smaller bronchioles, down into the smaller bronchioles. But then in the smallest bronchioles, and, and then onto what we call the respiratory bronchioles and the terminal bronchioles and the alveoli, they're not, they're not ciliated. So this could be a rationale for why the smallest um, bronchioles, the small bronchioles, then the respiratory bronchioles, then the terminal bronchioles and the alveoli in the lungs are not infected by Omicron because they are not ciliated. So that could well be the case. This is the only paper that's showing it so far, but pretty interesting. And then I think the last paper we'll deal with, because I know you're straining your concentration. I'm straining my concentration span. I must be straining yours. Uh, th 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 this last one here, again, available in preprint form. But these are all from, I mean, this is from people like, uh, you know, Glasgow Centre for Virus Research, School of Mathematics and Statistics, University of Glasgow, collaborating with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So it's not as if it's... Uh, um, uh, a silly paper by any means it's a very reputable sources the hypertransmissibility of sars coronavirus 2 i mean hyper very very transmissible exhibit significant antigen change vaccine escape and a switch in cell entry mechanisms interesting <clears throat> so omicron markedly decreased neutralization in serology it's not neutralized by the antibodies as we saw yesterday which is why symptomatic infection is breaking through now what they found was this was interesting who is most protected from symptomatic Omicron disease? Well, the people that are most infected are those that have had three doses of vaccine. And presumably those that have had infection as well as three doses of vaccine are even better protected. People who've got immunity from natural infection without vaccinating, they do second best and they do better than people who've had two doses of vaccine. So that, that's what they compared. People that had three doses of vaccine, people that had had the infection but not vaccine, people that had two doses of vaccine, they were most protected. They were second most protected. They were third most protected. They didn't say if there was a group that was even more protected who'd had the infection and the vaccine or the vaccine and the infection. They didn't study that, so that's, that's all we know. But three doses of vaccine given greater protection, at least for the time scale that the vaccination programme has been on, in the UK, which is all comparatively recently, of course, the booster dose vaccine in the UK, the third dose of vaccine in the UK, providing more protection than natural immunity, which is interesting. Uh, that's not telling us about severe disease, of course, it's just telling us about symptomatic infection, but really we're more interested in severe disease, but it's interesting nonetheless. Omicron compared to Delta, uh, compared to one of the original Wuhan uh, strains of the virus, particular mutant from Wuhan, Teeters of Omicron variant in the lung tissues were at least an order of magnitude lower at each time point compared to the other two variants. So what they did was they followed the infection through a period of time and always throughout the evolution of the infection as the body was getting rid of the infection, there was always 10 times less virus in the lungs compared to the wild Wuhan or the original Wuhan type and the Delta type. At least 10 times less virus in the lung so that's very encouraging because less virus in the lung we believe will lead to less pneumonia now this doesn't automatically follow because the, the virus the, vi the virus in the upper passages could lead to a to a, a systemic inflammatory response that could cause a cytokine storm but it doesn't seem to be doing that it seems that a lot of this inflammatory effect is localized so the presence of the virus in a particular place is what causes the inflammation of the virus in that particular place. So the virus in Delta, for example, is present in the lungs. Therefore, the inflammation occurs in the lungs. Therefore, patients get pneumonia. They get the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And because of the microscopic distances between the lungs and the blood vessels, 
in people with pneumonia who have inflammation in the lungs, it's only the tiniest couple layers of epithelial uh, endothelial cells thick, absolutely microscopic distances to get through and you're in the blood. And then, of course, that could account for the, uh, the, the problems in the blood vessels, the problems in the heart, problems in, in other organs as well. It could also account for some of the, uh, the thrombotic changes that occur around about the lungs as the virus leaks from the lungs into the um, adjacent uh, capillary and small vessel network into the venules and then after going around the circulation into the arterioles in the lungs. So um, it is looking like the the inflammation is localised. So this is, lo so again, not necessarily the case, but it's looking like it. Uh, so that's looking favourable that less viruses in the lungs therefore are likely to get pneumonia. This is consistent with uh, attenuated replication of Omicron in lower respiratory tissues as recently reported. In other words, all of these studies that we've looked at are all singing from the same hymn sheet. There are no studies, and I have looked, that, well I've done quite a few Google searches and Google Scholar searches and things, there are no studies saying that uh, Omicron causes more severe lung infection than bronchial infection. None. All the studies that we have, and we've looked at about half a dozen there, are all, all showing that it's more of an upper airway infection, uh, less likely to cause severe lung disease, consistent with the features that we are now seeing in 75% of people who have colds in the UK have a COVID cold in the UK, according to the latest ZOE symptom tracker data so if you do have a cold and you've got testing facilities available do test find out if you've got it then you can take precautions to not infect vulnerable people and also that also it'd be, it'd be pretty interesting to know if you've had it anyway because if you have had omicron as we saw yesterday you are going to be uh, i can't say immune but you're going to have a high level of protection against a future omicron infection and you also have a high level of protection against delta so if you've had omicron you are going to have a high level of protection as well the omicron will stimulate a good level of protection against delta which is why i believe delta will go away as we saw yesterday so the science is fairly good i'm going to do a bit of a crunch on the numbers tomorrow um, there's nothing that's causing great alarm at the moment the main problem just now is so many in, in hospitals for example there's so many people off sick so many people are self-isolating because of the current uh, isolation rules. This is what's causing um, states of um, um, states. What do you call it? States of not states of emergency. Whatever you call it, when hospitals are, are somewhat um, overburdened. Um, yeah, state of emergency. I think. Anyway, anyway, um, it's largely because so many people are off sick or having to isolate is the is the problem, rather than being totally inundated with with COVID uh, patients. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, if the numbers change, we'll, we'll report it straight away, of course. But so far, and the reason I've wanted to do quite a bit of science over these past three days is to show that the science is continuous with the data out of South Africa, the provisional data from the United Kingdom, and the data that is going to be coming out of the United States over the next week or two. Thank you for watching.